So I am back on the Words of Radiance um, pages for the Words of Radiance Leather Bound. After finishing, I had several weeks where I was signing other mm -hmm. things, and these feel now so we're enormous. Back on these. <laughs> because these are 16 pages, the first signature. What were the little gray ones that you were doing? Little gray ones were for Taiwan. Okay. Uh, and then the next batch were for the UK. So Nice. We, we let them slip in now and then. Um, I can only sign these. These have to go in March 1st. They were supposed to be in January 1st, but we pushed back the Kickstarter. So mm -hmm. uh, that gave me a little more time. So whatever I can sign by March 1st is how many we will have for signed edition uh in the uh the, the kickstarter for words of radiance so cool um so yeah D did i tell you we just hosted a taiwanese exchange student did you yeah well, that's awesome it was pretty awesome mm, i enjoy visiting taiwan um really like it there so. i've never been there but mm. i have friends there now uh we had a girl and her mom the mom is the administrator of the exchange program mm -hmm. so we we got to hang out with her while her daughter went off and did stuff with our daughter. Mm -hmm. But uh, we asked at the end of their stay, we asked the girl what her favorite part of America was, and she said it was our dogs. So, our dogs. Yeah. Well, wow. my dogs specifically. Okay. So we're gonna add those, I think, to the like us.gov tourist website. Like, do you really want the best part of America? It's Dan's dogs. Dan's dogs. You want people showing up? Being like, well, we were told we could. We were told that there's tour. awesome dogs. Yeah. I mean, mm. as long as they clean up after the dogs, I'm fine with that. <laughs> who does that? Why would you even think that? Like, who goes to a zoo and like, oh, we're going to clean up after you the animals. You don't clean up after the animals when you go to the zoo? That's really rude, Brandon. I mean, my children, if they count, <laughs> yes, I will clean up after them, but. I don't think I don't think they want you getting in the the enclosures anymore, Dan. Is, you know what happened last time? Is that why? Yeah, I have such weird experiences at the zoo. Yep, yep. I I'm mean, zooing wrong. You're zooing wrong. You're in there shoveling oh, manure, and they're like, uh, like, lions, and you're like, well, he's yeah, I got a shovel. Mm -hmm. What do you want from me? A food heist. A food heist. I have a food heist for you. Mm. This is a. Very intricate food heist. Okay. This is full-blown heist heist. Wow, okay. But it is also very small scale. Okay. So this is like the tutorial level of a heist. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, in Germany, a couple okay. years ago, uh, somebody, and they don't know who did it, sneaked into a field of asparagus and stole about... $5,000 worth of asparagus. Well, we know it was probably Peter Rabbit and his gang. <laughs> Isn't that what they do? No, because Peter Rabbit is not this professional. So okay. they went in, um, They and, and it says here in the article, all the police know about the thieves is that they know their way around an asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, man. Uh, not only did they harvest the plants correctly. Okay. But they closed over the holes after they pulled the asparagus out of the ground. And apparently, that is, like, key to the asparagus process. Because if you close over the holes, then the next season's crop will be good. And if you just yank them all out and leave the holes open, the field kind of goes okay. to waste. And, so they and were considerate. Can't come back. They were well considerate. As... They were professional. I think this might be asparagus insurance fraud. Really? Yes, because they, they, they're protecting the field. What thief, other than the groundskeeper, but he's in prison right now, would... This was two years ago. Oh, it could be, could be. You never yeah. know. Could be the groundskeeper. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be one of his early... Uh, his early this is yeah. when he was kind of testing some plans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, doesn't involve eggs. Does involve ground. It does involve ground. Yeah, so okay. Clearly, the freelance gardener. Yeah. This is the Slash kind of thing that he would do. Yes. Slash coffee expert. Slash coffee expert. Yep. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, no, and police are baffled. Yeah. Asparagus this, insurance fraud. That's that's what I'm calling. Four thousand seven hundred thirty dollars of asparagus insurance. Well, you know. Who's going to give you more on asparagus? Let's be honest, <laughs> well, I right? mean, this is Germany. Mm. Spargel they... is a big deal over there. Okay. 
German asparagus is much thicker than ours, and it is white rather than green. <laughs> and it's delicious. Nope, not gonna go there. <laughs> not gonna go there. Not gonna, not gonna, not gonna go there. Just okay. absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely ab nothing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. Nope. All right, so. Nope, not gonna go uh, there. Very professional hit on yeah. an asparagus field. Yep. 300 kilograms of asparagus gone missing. Uh-huh. Police are baffled. I'm... I don't like asparagus, so I'm amazed that asparagus is worth anything. Maybe you, you've never had German asparagus. Maybe, maybe that's true. Um, but um, asparagus prepared correctly, I can stand. Okay, but barely, right? Uh, the good asparagus that people are like you'll like this. I don't hate. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, but maybe it's just they're like, why did we grow asparagus? What's wrong with us? <laughs> like, oops. We we want to grow something that's actually good. So let's commit some asparagus fraud. They have, at least near where I lived in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, every spring they would do an asparagus festival. And you know that it's spring when you start getting uh, Spargel cream soup. This asparagus cream soup. It's delicious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not one to judge... We live in a part of Utah where every little town has some, um, <laughs> some really important to identity them crop crop festival. Like there's every every year, I'm I'll be we'll be driving through a town and there'll be like things going on, and Emily's like, "Oh yeah, you know, it's beat days." I'm like, mm -hmm. Beat days? I'm like, oh yeah, they have beat days here. Yeah, there's a parade. Like. like Beat days, and then we're going through another one, and they're like, "Oh yeah," she's like, "Oh yeah, this is this is um, you know artichoke days," mm -hmm. and every town has their little thing. Yeah, it's like okay, um, you can have your asparagus days. Um, uh, I can't remember what American Forks is. Is it Steel Days? Steel Days. I'm yeah. getting a nod from Dan the Audio that, Man. That's very, I mean, that's very Utah, but I think it's more just very small town yeah. America. Everybody has their little whatever days yeah uh though did you know since we're talking about this mm -hmm. uh utah and central utah specifically is the origin of the vast majority of every turkey sold and consumed in the u.s really mm -hmm. most of them come from like mount pleasant area had no idea yeah uh, did you know that arbor day started because of nebraska where i grew up i did not know yes. that Arbor uh, Day. John Arbor. Uh, and oh. there's an Arbor Lodge. I think it's okay. John Arbor. Something Arbor. Uh, so so yeah. wait, Arbor Day is named after a dude? Day named after a dude. I always thought for some reason that it was it was just a weird way of referring to a tree. Yeah. Is, is yeah, that I mean, what it is? Arboreal is. Yeah. Well, so, that's it's, the Spanish one. It's yes. It's, it's, it's either a nickname of his. I'm not remembering my, my Nebraska history. Or it's just a really cool coincidental name. I'm sure people in the comments who actually paid attention in their Nebraska history <laughs> lessons in Nebraska um, will be able to t uh, tell us. I was too busy focusing on the story about how Lincoln, the capital of Nebraska, ended up as mm -hmm. the capital when Omaha, which is 45 minutes away, is like seven times the size and a major yeah. metropolitan area. Is, is Lincoln yeah. more central to the state? No, the, the story is that they started to build the Capitol building in Omaha and a bunch of people from Lincoln snuck over and stole all the bricks and built it in Lincoln and they just had to keep it there. <laughs> That's the story that I was told in grade school. That's amazing. That's why I was paying attention. I hope that that is true. To that instead of Arbor Lodge. Because that is fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's wonderful. So, a guy named John Arbor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google this is, right now. Is Arbor short for arboreal? Ah, and he yes. actually just was a guy who lived in a tree? I want to say his name is John Arbor. I could, I could be getting mixed up for Johnny Appleseed. I mean, these are things oh, I learned in be. second grade, right? Okay. Um. And for some reason, you have not gone back since second grade to confirm yeah. the veracity yeah. of John Arbor, the yeah. orangutan in Nebraska. I'm a, John Arbor is a Canadian football professional, uh, professional ice hockey player. Sorry. I'm going to okay. guess not. It's probably um, not the same yeah. dude. But... Arbor Lodge. Okay. I know Arbor Lodge is like a thing. Um, so, ah. 
John Arbor textiles. Uh, this is this makes for riveting. Um, okay, I'm gonna just do Arbor Day. Riveting. Um, yeah. Well, we Google stuff. Google stuff. <laughs> Arbor Day. Arbor Day. Arbor Day is blah 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 origins and history. Um, so it's saying first Arbor Day was like in Spain. So maybe I was lied to. Uh, first American Arbor Day. Uh, J. Sterling Morton of Nebraska City, Nebraska. Uh, so John Arbor is just like, maybe it's like, I bet, you know, I bet what it was. There was some like kids book. It's like, that's mythologizing all of this. And it's like John Probably. Arbor sort yeah. of stuff. Like these are all second grade things, Someone but it is personified Nebraska. Personified your state. Yeah, personified my state as John Arbor or something like that. Tell us in the comments, any other Nebraskans, if you heard like stories about like some guy named Arbor um, and things like that. We got trees every Arbor Day. Did you? Uh, no, we actually, I don't remember ever celebrating Arbor Day in any capacity. We got trees. Because I grew up in Utah. We don't have trees. Yeah, that's true. You, you, you apparently have turkeys. We have Lots turkeys. Of turkeys. We have all the turkeys you can eat. Yeah. Um, you like you got a tree. We got a tree every like Arbor Day. Valentine's and, Day, you get a Valentine. Yeah. Arbor uh, Day, you were given at a tree. School, multiple years, we were given saplings to go plant. That's amazing. Like, That's why you yeah. have trees there, yeah. and we don't have any here. You know, also rain. Rain well, helps. I guess it does help. Fine. Um, but yeah. So there you go. There you go. I, I looked up this uh, Nebraska capital thing. Yes. And there's apparently... Absolutely true is what you're finding. Uh, I can't find just the first website I went to said mm. there was a controversy about where to put it. Yep. Uh, but no. I've actually looked it up and found the story uh, that is told. It's obviously not true. Oh, but that's a the bummer. The story is uh is one of these tall tales and legends that gets passed around that mm -hmm. uh that has been told. It's not like my teacher made that up and told okay. us that one. That one I was able it, to actually I, find. I love how it sounds like a university prank. Yes. Yeah, basically like we're going to sneak yeah. in and steal your mascot the night before the big game and yeah. now that makes us the capital of Nebraska. Yep. S steal yeah. the uh, there was a big controversy that was the actual sort of history mm -hmm. that the teacher was teaching um and uh to reinforce that we got told the story but even <laughs> when it was told to us i think the teacher was clear with us that this a very was tall tale a tall version tale. of like yeah it, it it does make sense mm -hmm. as a rumor like yeah. why on earth is the capital in lincoln yeah well this is the only thing that makes sense even though it's stupid well we all know that the only thing really important about nebraska is the Cornhuskers, the football team, and that's in Lincoln. So, okay. I mean, they were important for a couple of years. When I lived there, it's yeah. actually a really interesting correlation. When I lived in Nebraska, um, Nebraska won the, the football championship okay. multiple times. Very, I want to say three good. times in four years. Nice. I moved away. They ne haven't won since. They haven't huh? won since. No. Okay. Yeah. Has, has so, Utah won? Utah won once in 1986. Okay, you weren't here then. I wasn't here then. No. Nope. So we so, can't we can't claim may, that. Hey, I mean, I visited my uncle when I was eleven. Was it in eighty six? I think it was. Let's make double. Were check. you eleven? Um, you would have been eleven yes, in eighty six. I was eleven. I was eleven in eighty okay. six. BYU uh, wins football. Let's make sure. <laughs> Uh, this is this is welcome to Brandon welcome and Dan to Google we things. Google stuff. Um, champion, uh, <laughs> this this will be awesome if it's true. Um, it, oh no, it's eighty four. Eighty four. It's eighty four. Oh, the people who I oh. Pete is like dying. My brother in law is like, <laughs> oh, it's eighty four. Like, oh, you fool. That would have been so great. It would have been because I came when I was eleven, and I was eleven in eighty six. Okay, what if it works the other way? What if they won in 84 and then you came and took that victory back to Nebraska and that's when they okay, started winning? There you go. What hey, if that we, happened? We, we can we are authors. We can still make this work. <laughs> in defiance of logic and facts, we can make this work. Yeah. That's our job. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm there with you. What yeah. what was But why hasn't it not uh happened when happened I came back? Since? Well, it might just he be would the really like it to happen again. He so, would like to be conscious and aware uh, and not, what, five? Yeah. 
when uh, five when yeah. BYU won last time, huh? Diehard BYU football fan, I have been to like the only game of of BYU football I've been to that I wasn't required to by band. Not that I have anything against it, but mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know. The seating is terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to uh, in support of Pete, uh, my brother in law, so that <laughs> you know he he supports the dumb things. I drug him. <laughs> I made him you watch drug him. I drugged him. I had to. I made him watch Plan Nine from Outer Space. Oh, okay. <laughs> My recompense for that was was the terrible seating at Cougar Stadium. Which which was first? Plan Nine first. Plan Nine was and first. And then football was and then the football revenge. Football was the revenge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't mind a game of football, but those seats back me up. <laughs> they, I'm. They're bad seats. They're terrible seats. So, yeah. Yeah. He, he Pete Pete was a uh, Pete put up with Plan Nine from Outer Space. Um, I, 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 I'm going to work on him. We'll get him to our bad movie nights. He will eventually appreciate bad cinema. Uh, I don't think he truly appreciated plan nine from outer space for the, for the awesome experience that it is. Well, we're going to have to try again. Uh, I notice you did not come Pete, uh, when we watched Yo-Yo Girl Cop. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, come on. You're invited to all of our bad movie nights going forward. All right. When, when, when are we doing another one? Because you've told me I'm not allowed to pick the movie anymore, so I can't schedule one. I really want to do a Neil Breen film. We talked about this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I do we ease everyone into Neil Breen? Because we... I still want to make everyone watch Mom and Dad Save the World. Yeah. Uh, Mom and Dad Save the World, is it act truly bad, though? It's pretty bad. Is it pretty bad? Okay. It's bad and delightful in equal measure. Okay. Um, so we may have to ease people and maybe we should yeah, do, do something else first. Like Sharknado. Shark. See, that's, I don't know. I don't Sharknado know if I Sharknado. Sharknado is trying to be bad on purpose. But it's still good is what people say. Yeah. But that's the, that's I just, the thing. I don't know. I don't know. Ones that are trying to be bad, just, but regardless, um, uh, mm-hmm. segue, bad story idea. Whoa. I'm trying to be bad. I hey. like how you can just say segue instead of making one yeah 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 do you know that i for... declare segue <laughs> i declare bankruptcy um <laughs> for years i thought that the word segue was pronounced seg was seg because i thought that was short for segue and i thought the actual word segue is pronounced like or spelled like segue the machines you ride around on okay yeah and then for some reason, the, there's a weird French abbreviation. The, 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 the abbreviation of Segway, six yes. letters, yes. is Segway, five, five letters. letters. It's French. They don't have to make sense. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, I legit thought that that was the way it was. So please tell me that you mm-hmm. didn't, more than just pronouncing it Seg, you pronounced it with a French accent. I did not pronounce it with a French oh. accent. Um, but I don't I, know how you would pronounce it I did think, accent. I don't think I'm alone in this. Let us know in the comments. Uh, which, but uh, when I found out that I'm like, that's Segway, ah, so much of the world makes sense oh, this now. This makes sense now. That makes sense. Why did they spell it wrong? Oh, probably because oh, it's so hard to spell. English is weird. Yeah. No, I um, meant the Segway, the oh, device yeah. you ride around on. So the, uh, the one for me was epitome. Epitome. Pronounced mm-hmm. it wrong every time. Yeah. But this I, is just a sign that we were readers. Yes. That's we the, encountered these words yep. in written form. Yeah, but what's the? There was another one for me that um, that I pronounced two different ways. Like I'd heard the word, mm-hmm. and I'd read the word spelled, and I thought they were two different words that meant the same thing. Yeah, um, that, 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 that was happened epitome to me. and epitome. Ah, yeah. uh, epitome and epitome. Yes, mm-hmm. um, I think it was. Uh, it wasn't hypothesis, but it was something like that. Hmm. Um, that had, uh, no, it, it might've been hypothesis because I read, I, I read hypothesis as hypothesis. Hypothesis. Yes. Cause it's your thesis. It's just a better thesis. Yeah. Cause it's a hypothesis or, uh, all, yeah. Hypo would mean under, right? Under, under thesis. So it's the thing you have before you have like a real thesis, I guess. Here's I my know. hypothesis. Here's my hypothesis. I. Hey Dan, stop showing people your hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> this is a family friendly <laughs> podcast. Okay. Um, as long as we're mispronouncing words, I need to tell you to stop showing everyone your asparagus. <laughs> uh, Emily loves to do that on purpose. It's one of her things. Um, drives our kids up the wall. Um, she, she, you know, she does the, the standard ones like call target Target. But mm-hmm. she also has Parmesan. 
she likes to do Parmesan. She Parmesian. Likes, yeah. Um, she likes to say, she's got a whole bunch of them. She could go on for hours about all those because it's <laughs> your family and your dad. Because uh, my sister-in-law is here too, mm -hmm. uh, Becky, um, who, who did all of these things and infected it upon all of you. And now my kids are like, let's go to Target. And I'm like, oh, that one's so bad. Right. I like, never even for me. I never heard Target until I got married. OK. And then Dawn and all her like Denver friends, they're yeah. like, oh, the Target. <laughs> I'm like, why do you need to pretend that it's fancy and then mock it for not being fancy? Well, that's the Can't joke. Can't you just like go to the store? I don't yeah. know. I don't get it. Bad story idea. OK. Bad, story, bad idea. story idea. Bad story idea. Segway. Segway. Seg. It's a seg. <laughs> Let's have a seg yeah, into it. Bad story. Let, let's and let's have the um what's it Ep, not epitome the epitome the epitome of oh. the hypothesis of the story oh, idea the bad All right. story okay so for for years I've given up on this one because okay. I think it's a bad story idea but I'm excited many of the bad story ideas are like one line pitches that are kind of amusing that aren't actually a story mm -hmm. and that's what this is. Okay. Um, you learn to identify these as a writer. The That sounds better as an idea than it actually is because there's no story attached to it. Mm -hmm. I, for years, I'm like, I would like to tell a story about the most powerful magic sword ever created. But it's not power as in raw power level. It is in number of powers. <laughs> so this is the sword that everyone's like, I've found the most powerful sword ever. But it's like, yeah. I can make you be able to smell colors once a week on odd numbered years for 30 seconds. Plus, that's one of my 7,830 <laughs> powers. Uh, and, you know, it's it's one of those dumb pun joke ideas mm -hmm. that for years I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that someday. Someday I'm going to have this sword that's the most powerful sword. sword. That's, yeah. It's just the most full of powers. So it's a good bad story idea on the day where we're pronouncing things wrong. Yeah. It's, a, it's full of the most powers. So how do you turn that into a story? Because my first instinct is that somebody figures out the order in which those powers will appear and then uses, you know, then they do a heist or some kind of elaborate plot that requires at exactly 7.23 p.m. on Thursday, yeah. I need to be able to make all the porcupines invisible. Right. And that's what I'm good, that this is gonna work for me. I mean, that is how you make that story, that element of the story. Like the reason it's not a story is, it's just a funny thing to happen in a story. Mm -hmm. It's the same as like mystery men having the guy who can turn invisible, but only when no one is looking, right? Yeah. That becomes relevant at the end because mystery men's a good movie and they know how to do setup and payoff. Mm -hmm. But that's not the story. That's just one of the things they do as a setup and payoff. And yeah. this would have to be the same. This sword, everyone's always, you know, they get it and then they sell it or trade it away because it's basically useless. And someone finally starts cataloging all the powers and realizes that they can use this thing to accomplish this very specific thing they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes relevant later in the uh, at yeah. the end of the book. Um, but yeah, really what it sounds like is a really great D&D uh, &D item. Yes. To give your to give your party. Mm hmm. Um, I, I had uh, back when we were doing typecast and we were playing D&D &D on Twitch. Uh, I this was my favorite part of the game was finding the weirdest dumbest magic items, and sometimes they became beloved. I had a bag of holding that uh, said "tada" really loud every time you opened it, and the party loved that, and they would they used it forever. I also gave them the plus five sword Rupert's Bane that only had a plus five bonus against this one particular guy named Rupert. So this is this is. This is right up your alley, this yeah. sword of mine. Th this this most powerful sword. Yeah. Because it has the most powers. Yes. I would have loved that. See, the one of the reasons I realized that I'm probably never going to use it mm -hmm. um, is because there is a place for humor in stories. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And there's a place for humor in stories. But both of us have gone on this journey where we realize, probably wisely, um, that... Doing an entire book based around your individual quirks of humor mm -hmm. doesn't lead to something that many people want to read. 
Yeah. And both of us had this early in our career um, where we're like, oh, I could write comedy because you're a writer. You know, you find things funny. And so therefore you're like, I will write a comedy book. Mm -hmm. But there's a big gap between I find this funny and people will want to read this. Everyone will find this funny. Um, And I feel like with humor, we have a tendency, particularly as newer writers, to really drill in on on our individual type of humor because that's what you do in other aspects of writing to become a professional writer. So you find mm-hmm. your interests, what you're good at, you tell a story using those things, and it usually works really well. But in the humor realm? Mm, doesn't always. Doesn't well, always. And humor novels in particular yeah. feels like one of the absolute hardest nuts to crack. Yeah. Like, um, you know, I, there, there's a thriving market, obviously, for funny movies, for funny TV yep. shows, funny comics, funny everything else. It is rare you will find a funny fiction novel written and published in the United States for adults. Yeah. It's incredibly and rare. Even Pratchett, like I consider Pratchett one of the greatest writers, if not the greatest of our generation, right? Mm-hmm. Um consistently sold worse than he deserved to, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Because there's this sort of whatever stigma toward comedic writing and things mm-hmm. like that. And there are legitimate problems with it, right? Like it is um, naturally harder to get invested in a story um, that is only humorous. This is the Hitchhiker's problem. Mm-hmm. Hitchhiker's is wonderful. I love it. I love reading it. But I never really get invested in Hitchhiker's. And yeah. that's just a natural kind of problem. I always got mm-hmm. invest, invested in Pratchett because he was doing plot and character a little more yeah. than... Um, T- telling much mm-hmm. uh, deeper, much more dramatic, much more personal character-driven stories yes. than you expect mm-hmm. given the reputation of, oh yeah, this is funny fantasy. Yeah. Why do you think that that is such a problem for books? where it often isn't in other places. I don't like, know. You know, there, there's plenty of very hilarious movies, TV shows that are still also known for really good character work, right? Community is a such yeah. a good example. Uh, hilarious, I guess that may be a bad example because it was never super successful. It got canceled I twice. I think it counts, though. Uh, and I mean, The Office is the mm-hmm. the the standout example of that, where it's like it's ridiculous, but there's also a lot of character work bringing you back. Why doesn't yeah. it happen in fiction? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I wonder if just out on a limb here, uh, part of the reason is because it's you're one person writing it, mm-hmm. and that one person often, if you're if you're not careful will lean too far into one type of humor yeah. that is only interesting to them, um, right? Like this is, I, I've written, um, so um, Secret Project 1 has a humorous aspect to it, but I wouldn't call it a humor novel. Mm-hmm. It's humorous because I'm writing from Wit's viewpoint who likes a good joke and things like that. Yeah. But I deliberately write, write Wit as someone who uses a broad range of humor types um, because that's that's who he is. That's uh, whatnot. If I write a book that's only what I'm interested in, you get a sword that has a million powers, <laughs> but can't do anything. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's not a story really to go with it. It's just people encountering things. Like I, um, people always want me to finish this. They don't really want me to finish this, but they they think they want me to finish this. I have a little <laughs> short called "I Hate Dragons," which is also written with my just mm-hmm. standard humor, which is about a person. On a world where everyone has magical talents, kind of, um, you have a couple of them, yeah. and his magical talent is TS two. He tastes really good to dragons, smells really great, <laughs> and number two, he can he can uh, hear people's spelling errors when they're talking. Oh, okay. Um, and so he, yeah, and so Alcatraz, but one extra step into nonsense. Into its nonsense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I just wrote like two pages of it as as a writing exercise i post it people are like do more of that do more of that and i'm like no you don't understand this is about as far 
as this as that idea can be idea taken. can be taken without getting annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably already annoying to some people who read it. So <laughs> I don't know. I wonder um, if that's part of it. That's interesting. Um, it might be. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the successful uh, funny fiction written for adults does that we have a lot more of it out of England than we do out of the U.S. Uh, mm-hmm. Christopher Moore. He's mm-hmm. American, right? He's U.S.? Don't know. I don't know. Uh, he's the one I can think of mm-hmm. that is making a living selling funny fantasy and horror and stuff right. like that. There um, was Jasper Ford, but he's British. He's British. Um, Pratchett. Pratchett. Adams. All these other people. Yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, that is one thing. Um, we joke about the UK. I feel like because of some of the the roots that the UK has in the fantasy genre with uh, with Tolkien and mm-hmm. um, C.S. Lewis and things like that, in general, fantasy gets more respect in the UK than it does in the US. Um, maybe. I worry, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like the US has this like little brother syndrome a little bit to the UK sometimes, particularly in the arts, where it's like, what's the great American novel? You know, we dominate pop culture, but the real fancy stuff is British, um, <laughs> right? And because of that, we're a little more afraid of genre fiction, particularly in the kind of upper echelons, where in, you know, E3, our friend, uh, Ethan mm-hmm. Sprout, he went to the UK to get his master's uh, and doctoral work in sci-fi fantasy. Yeah. Uh, they had a program. Uh, and over here, he was having trouble finding any program that would, a legitimate, mm-hmm. you know, PhD program that would let him study uh, sci-fi fantasy uh, as literature. And he yeah. got one over there. That's that's not as much of a problem as it used to be. When it you isn't. and I were breaking in, it was absolutely yeah. a much bigger deal now. Um, but yeah, the like, and fantasy I, yeah. has has hit mainstream for the pop culture. Absolutely. I don't know. Well, okay. I think we're on that edge. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Game of Thrones kind of knocked on that door, but a lot of people who watched it just are like, this is really just a historical drama. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And then we had a number of kind of high profile failures, but they're all kind of this like trying to have one foot in Tolkien and one foot in Harry Potter and would never commit to either one. Mm-hmm. Um, this is your golden compass. The golden compass book is great, but I mean the movie yeah. um, and things like that. Uh, and I think you could be right. Shadow and bone and the Witcher and things um, are bringing this, but I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced. Well, I'm not 100% and, convinced. And I think you're right that uh, kind of in the in academia, mm-hmm. we're still miles away, you know, which is ridiculous to me. Uh, the same professor that will, you know, talk about the the brilliant whatever of Macbeth yes. and then turn around and say fantasy is for children. Like, come on. Dude. And I feel like there's less of that in the UK. Now, that yeah. might be just me mm-hmm. across the pond, but I feel like in general, the British populace is not as threatened <laughs> by this idea that sci-fi fantasy or humor mm-hmm. might be high literature also. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the the home of Shakespeare. Um, and so that might be why. Yeah. It's and it might just be more there. that they've been doing it for longer. Yeah. Um, I always remember my, my very favorite C.S. Lewis quote is that there is nothing more childish than the need to be seen as an adult, um, which is why he always thought, you know, fantasy has this reputation as being something for children, but no, everyone can enjoy it. Everyone can get something valuable out of it. And if you are the kind who says, oh, I don't read that, that's for kids, Mm -hmm. uh, then you're trying a little too hard. So in preparation for this episode. Oh, you prepared for this episode. I actually prepared for this episode because I have um, some one-star quotes of Terry Pratchett. Oh, really? Uh, um, not one-star, one-star reviews. One-star reviews. Terry Pratchett from Goodreads. Okay. Because I, uh, I was doing my thing where I'm like, I'm going to go read, remind myself that the world is full of people who um, have different opinions. <laughs> I'm glad you um, said different. Yes. I was going to say bad. Um uh, yes. Before you read these, I will just say this is advice I give to um, to aspiring writers all the time. Yep. That if you are feeling down, go read the one-star reviews of your favorite book, and you'll see that you just can't please everybody. 
Uh, no matter how beloved and wonderful a piece of art is, there are going to be people that hate it. So one star reviews of Terry Pratchett. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from Nightwatch, mm -hmm. uh, which is widely regarded as Pratchett's uh, finest um, in the disc world. Um, I would argue Nightwatch and uh, both of the first two Moist Von Lipwit books um, and The Truth all kind of go neck and neck for me. But it's Nightwatch, all Tiffany aching for me. Yeah. Um, here's, here's one star review. Okay. I read this a long time ago when my English wasn't good enough to understand everything. I did finish reading it, but by the time... but. All the time, I had the feeling I missed a lot and didn't get any of the jokes. One star. <laughs> so, you oh, know. Okay. A, a measured and well thought out review. Um, I am, by the way, skipping all of the me actual measured and well, well thought out. There are a lot of mm -hmm. legitimately, like, I didn't get this. It's not my type of humor. This didn't work for me for this reason. There's, there's no reason you shouldn't feel like you should be able to go and uh, give a one star review to anything. But I found it funny that it's a one star because you don't speak the language and so don't understand the book. One star. Uh, <laughs> next review. Uh, awful. One star. Just by itself. <laughs> um, um, next review. I was sick when I read it, so this for sure is not a fair review. I was hoping for something thoroughly silly with this book. What I instead got was a lot of biting political and social commentary embedded, embedded in a series of absurdities. Sometimes funny, even making me laugh out loud. One, One star. star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, I love that. Uh, here's yeah, I've got two more, okay? Um, gave up two thirds of the way through. Probably not a good choice if you haven't read the previous 28 books in the series. One star. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so, um, I just cannot stand fantasy science fiction and quote unquote creatures who talk in books. One star. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to read one of my favorite reviews I have ever gotten. Oh, dear. This is a one-star review on uh, Serial Killer, and it's from way back in the day when it first came out. I think I've heard this one before. And this ties yeah. directly into what we were saying about fantasy not being taken seriously. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one star, so disappointing. This book had so much potential. For the first six chapters, I was engrossed and couldn't put the book down. Something happened in chapter seven. It's as if a 10-year-old boy took over. $9.99 wasted. Chapter 7 is when the supernatural elements show yep. up. The quality of the book doesn't change. I would... I, <laughs> I, that is, you know, kind of soul-crushing, but it also is a decent reason to give something a one-star, right? The, I don't like supernatural. Mm -hmm. It didn't yeah. seem like that. I'm now warning everyone that this, if you don't want Supernatural, yeah. don't read this Absolutely. book. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the the review doesn't specifically mention this goes Supernatural. Yeah. And I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, most of these one-star reviews are, mm -hmm. I thought this was a serious true crime kind of thing. It turns out that it's a serious Supernatural thing. Instead, that's not what I read. Mm -hmm. So I didn't like it. It just is endlessly hilarious to me that... As soon as the supernatural elements showed up, yeah. the quality of the writing oh, diminished in his eyes. That's true. It became that's juvenile. That's what's fascinating. Oh, yeah. It's as if a 10-year-old boy took over. It's the yeah. same writing the it whole is. time. It's but really suddenly, strong writing. In his eyes, the it was poorly written, not just supernatural. I see what you're getting at. That, that's amazing to me. That is amazing. Uh, that's, yeah, that is, that is speaking to what you said, that as soon as, as soon as there's supernatural elements, well, mm -hmm. um, and, um, I just, I find these, I find these hilarious. <laughs> um, I, I, I find, you know, in some ways just mesmerizingly weird that someone could read Nightwatch, go yeah. and write awful one sentence, one, pe one word review. Mm -hmm. Um, but because this is in my opinion, one of the greatest books ever written. Uh, but that speaks to the diversity of human experience yes. and perspective. Yeah. And doing this as a, as a new writer is handy because it will remind you, everyone sees things differently and there is no objective quality to art. No art is objectively good. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there are some things that can be objectively bad, meaning, uh, you know what I mean? Like we've talked about this. Yeah. You can not do what you're intending to do because your skill level isn't high enough yet uh, and things like this. Mm-hmm. But what makes fantastic art is subjective. Yeah. Um, but I, I still find it, you know, hilarious that this is this is how reviews work. You're going to get, just know this, writers, you're going to get some bad reviews because people pick the book up in the middle of the series. Yeah. And then don't understand it. Get totally lost. Get totally lost and give you a one-star review. Others are going to say, this had, what did it say? Um, really biting social commentary and politics that made me, rap absurdities, that made me laugh out loud. <laughs> One star. One star. Yep. Um, yeah. And so. You know, I I don't read reviews of my own books in general. I, I, I did yeah. back in the day, which mm-hmm. is how I knew about this one and went and looked it up. Um, but I I do enjoy reading people's takes on other books. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the one stars, yes, if you just hated a book, that's fine. Give it one star, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm never going to complain about that. Yeah. But what... I find fascinating mm-hmm. is the people who will write a glowing review of, you know, this is so good, best book I've read all year, mm-hmm. four and a half stars. I'm like, what knocked it down? I can understand that, though. I can understand that. Let me let me try to okay. justify this okay. for people. Um, like, I never get bothered by the, I love this book, four stars. Uh, the reason being that everyone has a different review scale. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, what helped me kind of understand this is um, the Romantic Times book review uh, slash magazine mm-hmm. that was um, did some very nice reviews for me in the early days. They had a scale where four and a half was the highest that anyone was allowed to give a book until the book had been out for 10 years. Really? And if it spent, the, I, if there's a certain, I might be, you know, mm-hmm. mistaken yeah, the yeah. 10 year, but they had a beification sort of thing that you get four and a half stars. Mm-hmm. And then if you remain relevant, important, and beloved across those years, then you can be beified to a five star. Then they bump you up. And I think that's a genius way to do reviews, right? Like mm-hmm. I uh, oftentimes will review something and then give it a year and come back and be like, you know, it's grown on me over time. Or mm-hmm. I've kind of you know, not thought about this as much as I think about other things that might be worth knocking a star off or something. And so somebody who's like, I love this four and a half stars might be one of these people who's just like, I won't give it a five star Mm -hmm. until, you know, my third read and it still holds up or something like that. Everyone has their different scales. And so it's totally, I, I, I'm totally on board. However you want to (laughs) review things, even though we're joking about it, the Mm -hmm. people who give something one star, like, at least this person wrote, this is the type of book it was, the the Terry yeah. Pratchett. I laughed out loud, but it was one star for me. That just wasn't what they were looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? Like, yeah. it's well, and funny, that's, but uh, it's, yeah. it's totally valid. And and that's what uh, that's what you and I did with Time Wasters, guys. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to run a game review website yep. back in the very early 2000s. I think we started it in, we didn't start in 99. Yeah, we but, started it yeah. kind of while we were... Yeah. It was post-graduation, yeah. so 2000, mm-hmm. 2001. Um, we did this website, and we used a clock system because we were the yep. time wasters. Mm-hmm. And it was six clocks, but you weren't allowed to give a sixth clock to something unless you thought it was transcendent and perfect. Mm-hmm. And we thought that was such a brilliant system. Our reviewers hated it. <laughs> For the most part, yeah, but uh, but that that is similar to um, there is a a proposition, mm-hmm. I guess you would call it, that I have seen going around quite a bit actually, of people saying that award shows like the Oscars, the Emmys, etc., should be on like a three or four year delay. That would be. Brilliant. They won't do it because award shows mostly in those mm-hmm. echelons exist for ratings yeah. and uh and productions and things like that. But it would be it would be yeah. so cool if it were on even like a 10 year delay. What are the what are the movies from 10 years ago that mm-hmm. are still which ones hold up? Yep. Which mm-hmm. one do we look back on and say, oh, there's no way that thing won the award? Yeah. 
Uh, but see, at the same time, I mean, in the Oscars is a terrible example to use because yes. it is so politicized and so based on marketing campaigns. But I think that there is something to be said for the refrigerator logic of, I adored this movie when I watched it. The experience that I had was yeah. incredible. Three years from now, I'm not going to remember it. It's not going to hold up for me. See? But I watched it and I loved it. They should have. They should do two. They, they want to make the Oscars more relevant. They <laughs> added 10. Uh, they went to 10 um, you know, Academy Awards nominees instead mm -hmm. of five in order to get more big budget movies in there. They yeah. will never win. So that they would kind of fake people out and get them tricked into watching, thinking that the yeah. movie that they that they wanted, you know, mm -hmm. granted everything everywhere all at once probably will win this year. And that probably. is an amazing movie that a lot of people have seen. So yeah, thumbs and up deserves to win. Maybe it won't. But um, regardless, um, it would be wouldn't it be great if it's like Oscars had. All right. Here are the five movies that came out this year. We're going to give one of them best picture. And we are also going to award a best picture um, to a movie from 10 years ago that did not get best picture that actually deserved it or even if it did yeah i don't mind if yeah. you know the godfather wins twice yeah uh i don't know if the godfather won the first time around i don't mm -hmm. think it did actually but uh yeah i i think that would be cool and the hugos kind of does that they because they only do it for years that they didn't have an award yeah there. so the, it's like 50 years ago, this mm -hmm. would have won the Hugo. I, I this think year, it would be great if does. the Hugos had that. I mean, one of the things yeah. about it is um, another issue, particularly for books, and we're, get, we're running out of time, but yeah. an issue for books is it's very hard to determine how an entry in a series to, it should mm -hmm. be judged. Yeah. A lot of entries in series um, do worse at um, awards uh, in the book world than standalones tend to do. Mm -hmm. And this is natural. It makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Uh, because if you read um, the middle, a middle book of A Song of Ice and Fire, you don't know how this all connects. You, you know, it's, you're reading a sliver in the middle of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, does the story all work? And then the Hugos came up with the best series to kind of, uh, to kind of deal with this idea. But yeah. it is, I think, a problem in awards in general. This We don't know how this works like endgame is amazing i don't think anything else in cinema has done what endgame did the whole mcu experience mm -hmm. what do you do with that does endgame itself deserve the academy award or is there like some other way you can say look each piece individually is contributing to something much larger that deserves attention in a different way from this individual discrete segment or this story yeah. working. Anyway, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of these things that makes awards hard to judge. Yeah, it does. But anyway, how's that, Ben? You win the award in our hearts, Ben. <laughs>